Welcome to Stories from the NNI. I'm Lisa Friedersdorf, Director of the National Nanotechnology Coordination Office. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome Thomas Epps III, the Allen and Myra Ferguson Distinguished Professor of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering with a joint appointment in Material Science and Engineering at the University of Delaware. Thomas, thank you so much for joining us today. To get us started, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you first got involved in nanotechnology? Yes, I'd be happy to. First, thank you very much for having me today. So I'm a professor, as mentioned, at the University of Delaware, and our research really focuses on uh, polymeric materials and polymer science. And how I actually got started was I, I had the opportunity from my parents to be able to do internships in high school and in, and in college. And one of my first internships was actually working at NASA Langley. And I had the opportunity to actually make polymer films that could fly on the space shuttle and look at how they could be used for solar panel coverings. And so that got me really excited about polymer science and some of the opportunities for things that we could do with polymers in terms of making lightweight and next generation materials. And that really carried on through my undergraduate work starting at MIT and then continuing on through a master's and, and PhD work in actually designing some nanostructured polymers at the University of Minnesota. Following that experience, I moved to uh, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, where I worked on polymer thin films and combinatorial methods before I, I got to the University of Delaware. And one of the neat things is being based in chemical engineering and material science, we try to understand not only how polymer processes work, and so how we can design new polymers, how we can manufacture new polymers, but also what are the properties that we can get from these materials that really allow us to have an impact on society. So can you give a little more detail about the novel materials that you're looking at and what the potential applications might be? Yeah, so one example of materials that we're looking at are bio-based and sustainable materials. And so what we're really focused on is looking at how we can make polymers that do their job, but also then have a more positive, less negative impact on the environment. And one of the particular areas of focus for us is basically lignin. So if you think about trees, it's one of the major structural components of trees. And we like to use that primarily because it allows us to make polymers that have high strength, but as important, it's an underutilized resource. So if you think about maybe the paper that you would take notes on, that's made from the cellulose and other materials are made from the hemicellulose that can come from a tree or a herbaceous product. But the lignin's typically burned or thrown away in the landfill. So we found some unique routes to actually take that lignin harness it, make basically monomers, precursors to polymers that allow us to make high performance polymers uh, that are more environmentally friendly and also then less toxic. And so we, we really enjoy that opportunity to basically replace some of the conventional polymers that are being used commercially today. Will this play a role in mitigating the nanoplastic and microplastic problem we hear so much about? It's one piece in that puzzle. If we think about sort of that nano and microplastics problem, we can think about plastics waste in general from two basic standpoints. There are the current petroleum-based materials that are causing negative and harmful impacts and effects on, on the environment. And then there's also the opportunity to say, once we are able to remediate those, can we think about the next generation of materials that are going to be more sustainable, more bio-based, more secure in terms of their feedstock sources? And so in this particular case, we're looking more at that second half where we're able to generate materials that are more sustainable, greener feedstocks, use less toxic materials, and also can be sourced essentially locally, which allows us to have a more secure feedstock for these systems. I want to switch gears and talk a little bit more about your research group and the makeup of students, both undergraduate, graduate, whether or not you have high school students in your lab. You mentioned that that was an impact that you had early in your career. And then also, what disciplines do they come from? 
Yeah, so we have students all the way from high school students all the way up to uh, postdoctoral researchers. So we've been fortunate enough to be able to participate in things like the American Chemical Society Project Seed Program, which has allowed us to have uh, uh, high school students. And in one case, one of the greatest feelings that I've had is actually have a high school student as a high school freshman, so a ninth grader that joined my research group worked in the group for uh, three and a half years as uh, a high school student, came to the University of Delaware as an undergraduate student, worked in my lab, and uh, is now finishing up her graduate degree at the University of Pennsylvania, and actually was able, as an undergraduate student, to have a first author publication as a result of being able to spend that time in the lab. Um, so we have a mix of students that come from chemical engineering, material science, uh, mechanical engineering, as well as chemistry. And then what we look to do is really collaborate with some of our colleagues in uh, things like techno-economic analysis, life cycle assessment, toxicity of materials. So uh, we have a broad array of expertise in the group, and that really helps us to solve some complex problems. So one of the things that we talk about with respect to exploring nanotechnology is the need for specific instrumentation and tools. Can you talk about how user facilities or access to tools has impacted your research? Yes, most definitely. I would say that we're frequent users of the neutron source that is available at NIST. We've also been able to take advantage of things like the light source at Brookhaven, as well as then some of the neutron sources at Oak Ridge National Lab and X-ray sources at, at Argonne National Lab. And so it's critical for us, especially when you're looking at nanoscale materials, which are nanostructures that you obviously can't see under an optical microscope, to be able to have access to these sources where we can do real-time experiments so we can understand how processing a material influences the nanostructure. And we can look at that in real time at, for example, Brookhaven or Argonne National Lab, which is not something we can do using our conventional X-ray source that we've got in, in our labs here at the University of Delaware. I think one of the other things is really having access to the instrument scientists and being able to learn from and leverage that knowledge and expertise, not only in experiment design, but also instrument and equipment design. And that's really helped accelerate our research. That's a really important point. It's not just the equipment, it's the expertise to be able to use it well and understand the information that you get out. So I appreciate you making a point to acknowledge that important component, especially of the user facilities. So looking back to your early days doing research as first a high school student and through your undergrad and your work in nanoscience, can you share your perspective on where you've seen advancements in the past 20 years of nanotechnology and where you see the opportunities going forward? Yes, I mean, I think that one of the clear areas or two of the clear areas, I should say, where we've seen advances in, in nanotechnology are things like computer circuits and other sorts of devices that have allowed us to basically reduce uh, energy consumption, allow us to increase data storage, uh, move data faster. I think the other thing that, that we've seen is nanotechnology also as it relates to things like medicine. So in our group, one of the areas of focus is also designing nanocarriers for drug delivery and for gene therapy applications. And so one of the nice features is really that design capability. As a community, we've learned a lot more uh, in terms of how to design those nanocarriers, how to have them release a certain payload at a specific time. And we've even been able to see those things with, for example, the development of some of the coronavirus vaccines that have made recent news and were developed uh, relatively quickly. In terms of some of the particular advances, one of the key things is the ease of manufacturing. There's still a long ways to go, but we've come a long ways in thinking about how do we actually make a nanostructure? How do we put it 
in a specific location? How do we tune and change that nanostructure? And one of the things as we go forward is, of course, how do we do that faster? How do we do it essentially cheaper, more efficiently, with less waste and potentially in a more environmentally friendly fashion? I want to thank you for taking the time to talk with us. I have two quick questions I want to ask before we're done, though. And the first one is, if you had advice for a high school student that is interested in emerging tech or nanotechnology, what would your advice be? Well, I would say sort of two things. And for someone interested in in nanotechnology, a lot of what we do does uh, really focus on on math and science and passion. And so there's a lot of opportunity to follow your passion. There are a variety of things in, in nanotechnology, everything from materials to characterization to computational efforts that all blend together quite nicely. And so you don't necessarily have to say, I'm going to be in physics or I'm going to be in chemistry. You have the opportunity to really be open-minded when you think about nanotechnology. The other thing that I would say is that there's a lot of opportunity for impact in nanotechnology that involves policy, it involves law, it involves environment, and even communications. And so there are many opportunities to have an impact on nanotechnology without necessarily going into what one would consider to be the traditional science fields. And my final question is really just the last word for you. Do you have any final thoughts that you want to share with our listeners? I guess the one thing that I would say is that there's a lot of exciting opportunities in nanoscience and for the listeners just to think about all the impacts that nanoscale science has had on everything that you do. So as one key example, one thing people don't consider is there's a lot of nanotechnology that goes into the tires that you uh, use every day to potentially drive to and from work or ride the bus, et cetera. And so nanotechnology is everywhere. And as we continue to improve nanotechnology, we hope to continue to have positive impacts on society. 